Item number, SCP-001. Object class, Euclid slash Keter. Special containment procedures. Because of the nature of SCP-001, no containment procedures are necessary. 24-7 monitoring of SCP-001 is to take place from a safe, 10 kilometers plus distance from a predetermined location, Site Zero. The location of Site Zero is known only to the current SCP administrator and the single overseer level agent of Abrahamic Faith, 0514, assigned to monitor SCP-001 from Site Zero. Said agent is authorized to take any action necessary should SCP-001 become active and is required to immediately alert the administrator and all other overseer level agents should SCP-001 show any change in behavior as this may constitute the beginning of a Patmos XK class end of the world scenario. Should SCP-001 become active in any way, personnel are required to immediately consult the Patmos series of emergency orders. Decoding algorithms for emergency order Patmos are to be maintained on site at Site Zero in the possession of the designated observer and are to be transmitted to SCP Foundation offices only in the event of SCP-001 becoming active. Foundation personnel with vital roles in one or more variants of Emergency Procedure Patmos are to be advised to take the following precautions. To maintain good relations with one or more organized Abrahamic faiths. To maintain, on hand, a supply of the following. Holy water, a rosary, crucifix, cross, prayer rug, or other symbol blessed by an Abrahamic cleric of bishop or equivalent higher rank. A copy of Abrahamic scriptures, Torah, Bible, Quran, and standard emergency supplies in mobile form. Bug out bag. In case of a pre-millennial rapture scenario, all vital personnel are to designate a secondary operative of non-Abrahamic faith. Said secondary operative is to be informed of the location of the primary designate's copy of emergency procedure Patmos and mimetic kill agent inoculate and is to be kept on ready status to take over the primary's duties as necessary. To maintain familiarity with all other SCPs involved in possible Patmos XK class end of the world scenarios. Description SCP-001 is a humanoid entity, approximately 700 cubits in height, located in an undisclosed location near the intersection of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The following features are known about the entity. A number of luminous, wing-like appendages emerging from the shoulders, back, temples, ankles, and wrists of the entity. Although an accurate count has never been established, most observers place the number of wings at anywhere from 2 through 108, with the mean number being 4. A weapon, possibly a sword or knife, SCP-001-2. The weapon appears to emit flames at a temperature rivaling that of the sun, based on spectrographic analysis, although there appear to be no destructive effects from the intense heat on the surrounding area. Any entity that approaches within one kilometer of SCP-001 is immediately struck by the weapon and obliterated from existence. Any and all hostile actions taken towards SCP-001 have resulted in the annihilation of the attacker, regardless of range. See Incident Report Re Indian Ocean Submarine Missile Experiment, December 26, 2004. SCP-001 appears to be standing with its head bowed in a gesture of supplication, with SCP-001-2 held in both hands point down in front of it. Since originally recorded by the founder over years ago, SCP-001 has not deviated from this stance. Human beings exposed to SCP-001 report hearing a voice in their heads, giving them a directive which the subject reports cannot be disobeyed. The most common directive is forget, which results in the subject walking away from SCP-001 with no memory of having encountered it. On rare occasions, however, other directives have been given. The most famous of these is the one given to the founder, Prepare, which he has claimed formed the impetus for founding to catalog and contain any and all supernatural and or paranormal artifacts that represent a serious threat to the current existence of humanity. This is the organization now known as the SCP Foundation. Observers have reported that SCP-001 appears to be standing in front of a gate of immense proportions. 
Long-range photographs have occasionally detected what appears to be a pastoral grove within, containing numerous other entities of the same composition as SCP-001, as well as several fruit trees of unknown composition. Of particular note are two fruit trees of immense proportion, near what appears to be the center of the grove. One, it is noted, appears to be an ordinary apple tree, although the other bears a fruit unknown on Earth, described as data expunged. It is the avowed belief of the Founder that the gate which SCP-001 guards may be the gate to expunged, based on correlations with ancient Babylonian texts and the Dead Sea Scrolls. In which case, one can deduce that the entity known as SCP-001 may be expunged. Addendum 001-A Experimentation Re-SCP-001-2's -SCP Effective Kill Range 1. Experiment A one Class D personnel instructed to approach SCP-001 as closely as possible on foot. Result: Upon making visual contact with SCP-001, subject is ordered to leave. Subject immediately turns away from entity and walks away. Despite repeated orders to continue the experiment, Class D personnel refuses to obey and is terminated. Upon termination of Class D personnel, all research staff involved are immediately obliterated by an unknown force, presumably SCP-001-2. 2. Experiment B One remote-operated research robot guided to approach SCP-001 from the ground. Result: Upon approaching within one kilometer of SCP-001, research robot is obliterated, presumably by SCP-001-2. All further attempts at remote reconnaissance have the same result. 3. Experiment C 100 pre-programmed research drones instructed to approach SCP-001 from multiple angles simultaneously. Result: Coordination is successful, and all 100 drones cross the 1 km mark simultaneously. However, all 100 are simultaneously obliterated by SCP-001-2. Designated observer at Site Zero reports that SCP-001-2 appeared to strike in all directions at once. SCP-001 did not deviate from its stance while this took place. 4. Experiment D. Wire-guided missile fired from a distance of 3 kilometers. Result. SCP-001-2 obliterates weapon upon crossing the 1 kilometer mark, simultaneously obliterating the launch site and killing all personnel. 5. Experiment E Multi-warhead intercontinental ballistic missile fired from SCP nuclear submarine Nautilus. Result Sea Indian Ocean Submarine Missile Experiment, December 26, 2004. 6. Experiment F SCP-076 and Task Force Omega-7 instructed to approach SCP-001 on foot. Result SCP-076 refuses to carry out mission, despite not being informed of the mission's nature. Upon being asked why, SCP-076 replies, No. Just no. 7. Experiment G, SCP-073 Due to the results of Experiment F, SCP-073 was not informed of his destination until arriving at Site-0. Result: SCP-073 approached the site on foot. Upon seeing SCP-001, SCP-073 became distressed and asked to abort. SCP-073 was ordered to continue. At that point, the symbol on SCP-073's forehead became Data Expunged. Experiment was terminated due to Data Expunged. See Addendum 001-AA. Addendum 001-AA. By executive order of the Administrator, no further experiments are to be carried out re-SCP-001. No further SCPs are to be exposed to SCP-001. SCP-001 is not to be used to dispose of dangerous SCPs. Please see revised containment procedures for details. Addendum On The following errant transmission was received by Foundation personnel. Initiate Emergency Procedure Patmos Omega. Attention, all Foundation personnel. The following message was received at approximately this morning from Site-0. SCP-001 has left its location. 
The gate is open. They are riding forth. O oh God, it's so beautiful. The Lord reigneth. The Lord has reigned. The Lord shall reign forever. The Lord reigneth. The Lord has reigned. The Lord shall reign forever. The Lord reigneth. The Lord has reigned. The Lord shall reign forever. The Lord, he is God. 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 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Because of this event's confluence with the recent breach of SCP-995, the opening of SCP-616, and the activation of SCP-098, the Foundation is required to immediately begin preparations for an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. SCP-076 and SCP-073 are to be secured immediately. All personnel are to unlock and decode Emergency Order Patmos Omega, and follow all orders within. Site-19 is to be secured, and all non-essential SCPs and personnel terminated and or destroyed. Repeat, because of this event's confluence with the recent breach of SCP-995, the opening of SCP-616, and the activation of SCP-098, the Foundation is required to immediately begin preparations for an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. SCP-076 and SCP-073 are to be secured immediately. All personnel are to unlock and decode Emergency Order Patmos Omega and follow all orders within. Site-19 is to be secured, and all non-essential SCPs and personnel terminated and or destroyed. Repeat, because of this event's confluence with the recent breach of SCP-995, the opening of SCP-616, and the activation of SCP-098, the Foundation is required to immediately begin preparations for an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. SCP-076 and SCP-073 are to be secured immediately, Kane and Abel, my two sons. I am coming. All personnel are to unlock and decode, behold. I stand at the gate and knock, and if Anyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyanyan
What happens to such substances after being swallowed is unknown. Subject is intelligent, IQ has been measured at 128, and amiable, and regards the planet in his abdomen as a minor curiosity about his body. Subject seems to experience no stress about his unusual condition. When questioned about planet's origins, Subject replied, I just woke up one day, and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Subject has provided a social security number and driver's license number, and requested that they be checked against known records. When checked, it was discovered that neither had yet been allocated. Doctor has a weekly chess game with Subject, during which Subject's mental health is evaluated. Doctor reports that Subject does not seem to mind the restricted living environment and has yet to attempt to escape or show signs of violence or mental illness, though he has repeatedly requested a computer with an internet connection. It is recommended that this not be provided, as it may be used to compromise security. Item number 86243AR-001 Warning, item displays aggressive and dangerous behavior. Description 6 feet 5 inches tall, 97 pounds on average. Varies by 5 to 10 pounds higher or lower. Unknown age, gray-brown skin which may be bruising. Eye color, milky blue, no hair. Emaciated appearance. Bone and muscle structure unlike any recorded species. Legs are long and thin, ending in sharp black points. Three fingers on each hand, also ending in black points. Legs and arms are twice as long as the torso. No reproductive organs, anal orifice, ears, nose, or pores anywhere on the body. Head is spherical, very large in proportion to the body. The neck appears too thin to support the head. Mouth extends halfway around the head, no lips. 21 teeth spaced randomly around the mouth. Many appear broken, rotten, or chipped. Eye is a large ball-shaped milky blue sphere, presumably kept in the head or throat appears to roll into the mouth when the mouth is open, has no pupil or iris. Detail of current containment. Room is lead-lined and kept lit with floodlights. Temperature is kept at 98 degrees with 100% humidity. Room is sealed with a reinforced steel blast door. Outer area patrolled by guards with high-powered strobes. Anybody entering the containment room should carry a strobe and wear welding goggles. Any person attempting to remove the item or enter without authorization is to be shot on sight. Report Recovered in Guatemala early this week, first reported as a demon seen by several boys on a rural road. Appeared to be sick or injured. The boys reported seeing the creature panting and jerking its legs. Creature then raised its head and exposed its eye. Boys ran home, reporting to local law enforcement. Several reports of horrible roaring or shrieks from locals over several days. Twelve people were admitted to the local hospital with severe radiation poisoning, and seven were reported missing. A recovery team was assembled, headed by General Machoy, and dispatched from base ADRX-19. Reports to overseers from the recovery team after standard containment failure led to additional containment protocols developed by Dr. Herman Ketter. Dr. Ketter was unfortunately killed in initial testing, after which Creature was moved to ADRX-19. Creature appears to be able to create micro-singularities, using them both as a form of teleportation and defense. These singularities disappear several seconds after creation, but emit massive amounts of radiation and cause severe damage to the surrounding area. The eye appears to control these manifestations, as it has always had the eye exposed when creating a singularity. Omnivorous, it views humans as a food supply. Creature shows signs of extreme fear and sickness in the presence of high heat, humidity, or bright flashing lights. Creature appears unable to teleport through lead and cannot form singularities when in its sick state. When well, it is an extremely fast and cunning being and has killed several recovery agents with both its singularities and claws. Emits occasional shrieking sounds. All attempts to communicate have failed. Addendum Additional objects reported. Overseers considering conversion of ADRX-19 to a dedicated recovery and containment facility. Reports may need censorship for reasons of security. Item number SCP-030 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-030 is to be held at Site-17 within a modified humanoid containment cell. Minor adaptations to accommodate its stature, such as an appropriately scaled workspace and chair, are to be included. Lighting within the cell may be altered upon request of SCP-030 to a maximum of 2,000 lumens via a simple dimmer switch. Should the need to render SCP-030 inert arise, staff may extinguish the lighting from the exterior switch and draw blackout curtains as necessary. Standard night vision equipment is available for observation of SCP-030 in its inert state. SCP-030 may request materials for personal research every 90 days. All previously requested materials are to be collected and destroyed prior to delivery of new materials. All materials are to be evaluated and screened by both research and security staff. SCP-030 is to be denied access to any modern scientific journals or texts and fiction is to be restricted to works produced no later than 1623 CE to preserve the integrity of its innate knowledge. Staff wishing to consult with SCP-030 in writing are to place a formal request with the supervising researcher on duty. All correspondence is to be retained. Staff wishing to consult with SCP-030 in person are to submit a formal request to site management at least 30 days prior to their preferred consultation date. All consultations are to be recorded and retained. Senior research staff may request SCP-030 be temporarily removed from its containment for a maximum of one hour to provide observational insight into non-restricted materials or events within Site-17. Under no circumstances is SCP-030 to leave the confines of Site-17. Requests must be presented in person to site management and security staff at least 30 days prior to the preferred observational release date. All observational release events are to be recorded and retained. SCP-030 has been equipped with a tracking device, inventory control code number 030-17-1, so its location within Site-17 may be determined precisely at any time. Description: SCP-030 appears as a hairless, genderless, gray-toned human, 71 centimeters or 28 inches in height, and weighing 12.7 kilograms too British stone in antiquated measure. Its solid blue eyes lack discernible irises or pupils, and resemble small cut sapphires. SCP-030 possesses an androgynous voice with a pronounced English accent, not currently identifiable as specific to any modern region. It is able to converse, read, and write in ancient Greek, Latin, Italian, English, Spanish, and Portuguese, as well as two additional languages that have not yet been identified despite SCP-030's insistence that they should be common knowledge. SCP-030 has also demonstrated knowledge of physics, chemistry, astronomy, mathematics, and horticulture, roughly equivalent to that of a 17th century CE academic. In addition, SCP-030 has demonstrated knowledge on these topics along research lines that do not appear in the historical record. These alternative or entirely unknown approaches to research in the natural sciences are one source of SCP-030's utility in consultation. SCP-030 remains active while a 15 lumen source of light or greater is within 1.5 meters, or 5 feet. In the absence of light, SCP-030 becomes inert, apparently losing consciousness and showing no outward signs of life. Within 5 to 10 seconds of being re-exposed to light, SCP-030 becomes active once more, appearing to come out of a light slumber no matter how long the period of inactivity has been. SCP-030 does not appear to require these periods of inactivity as a human would require sleep, and has expressed a desire to remain active as often as possible. Biopsy analysis of SCP-030 remains inconclusive. While clays native to the English counties of Kent, Surrey, and Greater London make up the majority of its structure, traces of mandrake, mandragora officinarum, lye, mercury, and human blood have been found in each sample taken. SCP-030 has expressed that a full exploratory surgery to determine its workings would potentially end its existence. Samples removed from SCP-030 do not regenerate, and sampling is currently discontinued to preserve its integrity. Although SCP-030 can be damaged, it does not appear to feel pain, and will simply remold any portion of its anatomy that experiences deformation. Notably, SCP-030 cannot be molded directly by human hands, though any number of tools may be used to alter its surface. SCP-030 does not respirate, requires no sustenance, and produces no waste. 
although it does infrequently request a bath. SCP-030 refers to itself as Ariel and regularly requests that staff do the same. Questions regarding how SCP-030 was created and by whom are routinely answered with the seemingly rote statement, I have been asked to forget that bit of information. Terribly sorry. SCP-030 delivers this response in the same tone and cadence each time any question regarding its origins or creator are presented. Given its composition and location of origin, a link to the alchemists of Alagada is suspected. SCP-030 was discovered June 12, during a mandatory archaeological survey within London's Mortlake District, pending construction of a car park. It was buried approximately 2.7 meters or 9 feet below street level, contained in a small stone sarcophagus. The sarcophagus bore no markings and was assumed to be that of a deceased infant as additional graves were discovered in the survey area. The sarcophagus lid was shattered during the excavation, exposing SCP-030 to daylight. Upon being struck by the sun's rays, SCP-030 roused from its inert state to one of mild activity within a few seconds, stating, good afternoon, to the assembled construction team. A member of the Foundation's Greater London Recon Force was summoned within hours and took the specimen into custody without resistance. The limited number of witnesses were given amnestics and released. Addendum 1. Document 030-C. Security Logs for SCP-030. September 14th. Tracking system installed for SCP-030. December 21st. SCP-030 reports malfunction of its own tracking system. Repairs completed within six hours. SCP-030 offers to assist, but is refused for security purposes. March 13th. SCP-030 completes 18-week seminar on Unknown Language Alpha, Zephyr. Five staff researchers considered fluent. Lexicography transmitted to 05-1. July 2nd. While in consultation, researcher inadvertently makes several remarks regarding photovoltaic technology. Consultation ended before the researcher can substantively elaborate. August 12th. SCP-030 requests a supply of magnesium and indicates it intends to ignite samples to study the light produced. Request denied by researchers. November 14th. Incident 030-1. Using what only appears to be standard potting soil, ginger, Zingabero officinal, a 72-gram sample of rutilated quartz, and a 23-centimeter length of coiled copper wire, SCP-030 produces an object or device capable of emitting notable levels of directed ultraviolet light through unknown means. Device is confiscated. Effects not currently replicable without direct intervention from SCP-030. Researchers currently in consultation to determine if this line of SCP-030's research will be permitted to continue. It is speculated SCP-030 may be working towards an alternative and possibly anomalous manifestation of the photoelectric effect after receiving only minimal information regarding its existence. All research by SCP-030 suspended and materials removed, pending review. Item Number SCP-049 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-049 is contained within a standard secure humanoid containment cell in Research Sector 02 at Site 19. SCP-049 must be sedated before any attempts to transport it. During transport, SCP-049 must be secured within a Class 3 humanoid restriction harness, including a locking collar and extension restraints, and monitored by no fewer than two armed guards. While SCP-049 is generally cooperative with most Foundation personnel, outbursts or sudden changes in behavior are to be met with elevated force. Under no circumstances should any personnel come into direct contact with SCP-049 during these outbursts. In the event SCP-049 becomes aggressive, the application of lavender has been shown to produce a calming effect on the entity. Once calmed, SCP-049 generally becomes compliant and will return to containment with little resistance. In order to facilitate the ongoing containment of SCP-049, the entity is to be provided with the corpse of a recently deceased animal, typically a bovine or other large mammal, once every two weeks for study. Corpses that become instances of SCP-049-2 are to be removed from SCP-049's containment cell and incinerated. 
SCP-049 is no longer permitted to interact with human subjects, and requests for human subjects are to be denied. Temporary Containment Procedure Update Per Containment Committee Order 049.S19.17.1, SCP-049 is no longer permitted to interact directly with any members of Foundation staff, nor is it to be provided with any additional corpses to be used in its surgeries. This order shall persist indefinitely, until such time a consensus regarding the ongoing containment of SCP-049 can be reached. Description SCP-049 is a humanoid entity, roughly 1.9 meters in height, which bears the appearance of a medieval plague doctor. While SCP-049 appears to be wearing the thick robes and the ceramic mask indicative of that profession, the garments instead seem to have grown out of SCP-049's body over time. The robes and gloves are identical to a thick hide, built up on the skin, while the mask is composed of a kind of chitin growing out of the bones of the face, and are now nearly indistinguishable from whatever form is beneath them. X-rays indicate that despite this, SCP-049 does have a humanoid skeletal structure beneath its outer layer. SCP-049 is capable of speech in a variety of languages, though tends to prefer English or medieval French. The entity claims to have originated in 15th century France, though admits that it is particularly well-traveled. While SCP-049 is generally cordial and cooperative with Foundation staff, it can become especially irritated, or at times, outright aggressive, if it feels that it is in the presence of what it calls the Pestilence. Although the exact nature of this Pestilence is currently unknown to Foundation researchers, it does seem to be an issue of immense concern to SCP-049. SCP-049 will become hostile with individuals it sees as being affected by the Pestilence, often having to be restrained should it encounter such. If left unchecked, SCP-049 will generally attempt to kill any such individual. SCP-049 is capable of causing all biological functions of an organism to cease through direct skin contact. How this occurs is currently unknown, and autopsies of SCP-049's victims have invariably been inconclusive. SCP-049 has expressed frustration or remorse after these killings, indicating that they have done little to kill the pestilence, though will usually seek to then perform a crude surgery on the corpse using the implements contained within a black doctor's bag it carries on its person at all times. The space within this bag is seemingly anomalously large, as SCP-049 has been observed pulling objects larger than the bag itself from within it in order to operate on deceased subjects. While these surgeries are not always… successful, they often result in the creation of instances of SCP-049-2. SCP-049-2 instances are reanimated corpses that have been operated on by SCP-049. These instances do not seem to retain any of their prior memories or mental functions, having only basic motor skills and response mechanisms. While these instances are generally inactive, moving very little and in a generally ambulatory fashion, they can become extremely aggressive if provoked, or if directed to by SCP-049. SCP-049-2 instances express active biological functions, though these are vastly different from currently understood human physiology. Despite these alterations, SCP-049 often remarks that these subjects have been cured. Addendum 049.1 Discovery SCP-049 was discovered during the investigation of a series of unknown disappearances in the town of Montauban in southern France. During a raid on a local home, investigators found several instances of SCP-049-2, as well as SCP-049. While law enforcement personnel engaged the hostile 049-2 instances, SCP-049 was noted as watching the engagement and taking notes in its journal. After all of the 049-2 instances were dispatched, SCP-049 willingly entered Foundation custody. SCP-049 Upon Discovery The following interview was conducted by Dr. Raymond Hamm during the initial investigation. Interviewer Dr. Raymond Hamm Site 85 
Interviewee, SCP-049. Begin log. Alors, comment devriez-vous donc commencer une introduction? Is that... is that French? Can we get a translator? The King's English. No need for translation, sir. I can speak it well enough. Good. My name is Dr. Raymond Ham, and I... Ah, uh, a doctor. A like-minded individual, no doubt. Wherein is your speciality, sir? Cryptobiology. Why? <laughs> a medical man, such as myself, wanders abound. And here, I worried I had been abducted by common street thugs. This place, then, this is your laboratory. I had wondered, as clean as it is, and with such little trace of the pestilence here. The pestilence? What do you mean? The scourge. The great dying. Come now, you know the... What is it they call it? The... The... Yeah. Ah, no matter. The pestilence, yes. It abounds outside these walls, you know. So many have succumbed, and many more will continue to, until such time as a perfect cure can be developed. Fortunately, I am very close. It is my duty in life to rid the world of it, you see. The cure to end all cures. When you say the great dying, are you talking about the bubonic plague? I don't know what that is. Uh, I see. Right, well, the entities are agents encountered at the house. Uh, they were dead when you encountered them. Yes, you reanimated them. In a manner of speaking, you see things too simply, Doctor. Expand your horizons. Life and death. Sickness and health. These are amateur terms for amateur physicians. There is only one ailment that exists in the world of men, and that is the pestilence, and nothing else. Make no mistake, they were very ill. All of them. You think you cured those people? Indeed. My cure is most effective. But the things we recovered were not human. Yes, well, it is not a perfect cure. But that will come with time and further experimentation. I have spent a lifetime developing my methods, Dr. Ham, and will spend a lifetime more if necessary. Now, we have wasted too much time. There is work to do. I will require a laboratory of my own, one where I can continue my research unimpeded. And assistance, of course, though I can provide those on my own in time. <laughs> oh, I don't think our organization would be willing to- Nonsense. We are all men of science. That's your coat, and show me to my quarters, Doctor. Our work begins now. End log. Interviewer's note. While SCP-049 is capable of communicating in a very human way, there is a strange sense of unease that one experiences when in its presence. Make no mistake. There is something very uncanny about this entity indeed. Additionally, we've confiscated that pointed stick that SCP-049 keeps waving around. Part of this was due to standard confiscation protocols for the possessions of anomalies, in part because 049 really is a menace swinging it around like he does. The entity was displeased at first, but after we made some concessions in providing it with test subjects, which are admittedly more for the benefit of our own research, it warmed up to the idea. Addendum 049.2 Observation Log While in containment at Site-19, SCP-049 has spent a considerable amount of time studying and performing surgery on the various mammalian corpses it has been provided. SCP-049 will routinely spend several days performing surgery, and then, regardless of whether or not the corpse becomes an instance of SCP-049-2, spending several more days documenting its findings in a thick leather journal stored within its doctor's bag. SCP-049 will often seek to share its findings with members of Foundation staff. Notably, SCP-049's journals are not written in any known language, 
and attempts by linguists and codebreakers to decipher them have been unsuccessful. The following is a log of several occasions during which SCP-049 was observed operating on a mammalian corpse. Observational Log 049.ol.1 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface A test subject D-85123 was introduced into SCP-049's containment cell. The entity expressed sincere gratitude towards all members of the containment and research staff. Observation Notes SCP-049 began by asking D-85123 several standard medical questions, as it began removing tools from its bag. Shortly after finishing its preparations, SCP-049 quickly closed the distance between the two, killing the subject with a touch to its throat. Afterwards, SCP-049 made a number of considerable alterations to the basic structure of the subject's corpse often introducing fluids from within its bag into the subject by way of a hand-powered pump and copper tubing. The resulting 049-2 instance became animated, flailing and grasping at the walls of the chamber with a number of manufactured limbs, while moaning out of an oblong orifice now present in its sternum. During this time, SCP-049 was observed taking notes of the instance in its journal, and remarking to the watching research staff about the efficacy of its cure. Security personnel entered the chamber to move SCP-049 back to containment, and were attacked by the instance. The security team dispatched the 049-2 instance, and SCP-049 returned to containment with no resistance, stating that it was pleased with the results. Observational Log 049.ol.2 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased goat. SCP-049 expressed gratitude at the provision. Observation Notes SCP-049 operated on the goat corpse for several days, eventually resulting in an instance of SCP-049-2. SCP-049 expressed pleasure in this outcome, though admitted the disease was still in its nascent stage. My veterinarian practice is rudimentary but the patient responded well to the procedure. Observational Log 049.ol.3 Summary Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased orangutan. SCP-049 expressed noted gratitude at the provision due to the similarities between the orangutan and common human physiology. Observation Notes SCP-049 spent several days operating on the orangutan, reanimating it several times. However, SCP-049 appeared to be discontent with the results it experienced, returning to the creature three times after its initial reanimation for additional work. After it was unable to reanimate the corpse a fifth time, SCP-049 turned the corpse over to Foundation staff for incineration, stating, I have learned so much from this. Though I fear my early optimism was misplaced, I hadn't yet come across such a… a stumbling block on my road to the cure. More subjects like this would do a great deal in advancing my research. Observational Log 049.ol.7 Full Subject SCP-049 Preface SCP-049 was provided the corpse of a recently deceased bovine. SCP-049 expressed mild annoyance at the provision, though accepted it nonetheless. SCP-049 had stated its desire to work on human subjects several times between this occasion and the earlier provision of an orangutan, noting its discontentedness when they would not be provided. Observation Notes SCP-049 spent several days operating on the bovine corpse, breaking only to dine on a requested dinner of thin crackers, salted pork, and hard cheese. SCP-049 has expressed that it does not require sustenance, but enjoys it and feels that the food helps to put it in the right mind to operate. Beginning first by embalming the corpse, SCP-049 was observed producing a number of long syringes from its bag, each containing a different dark viscous fluid. SCP-049 described these fluids as essences of the humors and elaborated by saying, 
The pestilence may bring about a systemic imbalance. In such a case, before true healing can begin, one must find the humors and balance, or the body will reject the cure. SCP-049 added to this statement by saying, This is, of course, elementary knowledge for the practical physician. I would have thought you would have learned this during your education. Over the next few days, SCP-049 spent a considerable amount of time adjusting the organs of the bovine corpse with a number of large metal instruments. After eight days, SCP-049 produced a lightning rod, which Dr. Ham exchanged for an electric cattle prod attached to an extension cord, and struck the corpse in several locations. This action seemingly had the effect of reanimating the bovine, which once again became ambulatory, despite the inversion of the head and reorientation of its limbs. Follow-up interview. Begin log. We've watched you work for several weeks now, and honestly, I'm not sure I understand what you're doing. Could you describe your process in detail? Oh, goodness, no. The process is most intensive. As I said to your assistant, the best instruction you will find about my methods are here in my journals, as I have kept exhaustive records of my work there. Oh, I see. Well, my concern, Doctor, is that we still don't understand what you're seeking to cure, or how it manifests, or how turning these creatures into quasi-living, mindless drones helps in that effort. You do not understand the pestilence, even after all this time. Doctor, it is an unspeakable horror, one that has shown its true face many times before, and will again. I find myself blessed with the wisdom and good senses needed to root it out and destroy it. But many, like yourself, cannot. It is a cruel judgment, I fear to be at the mercy of a disease you cannot fully comprehend. That still doesn't answer my question. How's your cure any kind of cure at all? It is a cure. You may laugh at my efforts if you please, but do not besmirch the good name of scientific progress that has developed this great mercy. What you short-sightedly see here is a life better than any this creature could have hoped for. Stricken as it was with the pestilence, this creature is now clean, unable to spread the pestilence, and free from the terror it would have experienced otherwise. This is hardly a creature at all, Doctor. It's not even- Do not jape with me, sir. You and your colleagues are like so many others, unable to look past minor setbacks to see the salvation taking place before your very eyes. Do you wait to remove rotten timbers until the hall collapses on top of you? No. You find them and you pull them out and replace them with those untouched by rot. And most of all, you do not simply mock the structure because it now looks different to you. It is strong. It is free of disease. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to agitate you. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Well, do mind your words in the future, Doctor. I am a professional, but even professionals may feel the bite of pride in dealing with criticism of their masterpiece. I will forgive this as an act of good faith between colleagues. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, that will be all. Another test subject on the usual schedule. You know my preference of subjects with more human anatomies. End log. Attending researchers note, SCP-049 does seem to genuinely want to help other humans, though it has not yet been able to provide a concrete example of what exactly it is trying to save us all from. I have watched it now over several weeks, and while the outcomes do not seem to ever change, SCP-049 continues to claim that it is growing closer to its perfect cure. I think the entity may be more aware of the reality of these outcomes than it would like us to think. Addendum 049.3 04-16-2017 Incident Starting shortly after SCP-049's initial containment, Dr. Ham conducted a number of interviews with the subject regarding its anomalous properties, and over time began to note its displeasure with its subjects and the SCP-049-2 instances. 
This continued for a period of several months, during which SCP-049 never exhibited any aggressive behaviors. On April 16, 2017, as Dr. Ham was entering SCP-049's test chamber to conduct another routine interview, the entity began to grow anxious and asked Dr. Ham if he was feeling well. Following protocol, Dr. Ham reminded SCP-049 that the interview was required, after which the entity became hostile and attacked Dr. Ham, killing him. Due to a lapse in security protocol, and because Dr. Ham did not activate the in-chamber emergency system, Dr. Ham's corpse was not discovered until three hours later, by which point SCP-049 had converted it into an instance of SCP-049-2. In the aftermath of this incident, SCP-049 was interviewed by Dr. Theron Sherman. Interviewer, Dr. Theron Sherman, Site-42. Interviewee, SCP-049. Begin log. I need you to explain yourself. SCP-049, you are being directed to explain your actions and I will remind you that failure to cooperate will result in further restrictions during your containment. My actions do not need to be explained. You killed Raymond Ham, and then butchered him until not he- Not dead. No, not, not dead. He is, he is cured. Cured? Cured of what? The pestilence, sir. I had thought you, at least would realize what luck it is. I detected it before. What pestilence? You keep going on and on about this pestilence, but you have not once been able to properly identify this disease. What could you have possibly seen in him today that you had not seen so many times before? That it would be worth his life? He... The pestilence presents and progresses in unforeseeable fashions and has a queer way of... of creeping into the unprepared. And... Call it what you want, Doctor. It was a mercy I did to him. He is cured. He is a vegetable. I... I would not expect you to understand. You and your... Your ilk have proven time and time again not to be men of science, but men of... of emotion. You cannot appreciate the horrors I have seen. Those many millions who have succumbed to the pestilence and been changed. Your cure cost Ray his life. No, good sir. I have saved it. You would allow this world to slip back into the, the despair of disease and death, ignoring that I have created a miracle. And what disease? What pestilence? He was a healthy man. He was a good doctor. I'm offering it freely to the afflicted. You are not worth this argument, sir. You are short-sighted and foolish. Dr. Ham was sick, and I... I cured him. I am the only one who can do this. My work must continue. There is still so much to learn, so much I've to had do. enough of this. And Consider your allowances be saved. Even you. Welcome to containment, you 049. Might be saved. We're done here. I can save them all. I can cast down this plague once and for all. I can do this. Only me. I... I saved him. I saved him. Dr. Ham. I... I cured him. He was sick. I know he was sick. I know he was. And I... You are all sick, but I, I can save you. I can save all of you because I, I am the cure. End log. Addendum 049.4, Post-Incident Report Interview. The following interview is an excerpt from the 4-16-17-049 Incident Report. The interview was conducted by Dr. Elijah Itkin and took place three weeks after the start of the initial investigation. Date, 5717. Interviewer, Dr. Elijah Itkin. Interviewee, SCP-049. Begin log. SCP-049, 
We are conducting this interview to close out our investigation of your actions taken on April 16th that resulted in the death of a staff member. Do you have any comments to make? Only that I look forward to the day when you will allow me to resume my work. I have spent the last few weeks compiling my notes and constructing a new theory for how the pestilence was able to infect someone in such an insidious manner that I nearly couldn't detect it. Have you experienced any remorse for your actions? For the death of Dr. Ham? Ah, oh, yes. Well, the death of a colleague is always regrettable. But in the face of the pestilence, we must be swift, Doctor, and act without hesitation. Dr. Sherman noted in his report that you seemed to be mournful during your initial interview. Mourn? Perhaps. I had not thought that. It is lamentable that a fellow doctor became infected, but the work continues. Regrettable as, as it was, Dr. Ham's death provided important insight. Living human subjects are the only way to proceed forward, I am decided. My cure is of little use on dead flesh, and I have gleaned all I can from your generous supply of corpses. My desires turn towards tending to those still living who suffer from the disease. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> oh, Doctor. I wouldn't be so sure. End log. Item number. SCP-054. Object class. Safe. Special containment procedures. Subject is held in a watertight isolation room, outfitted with specialized climate control equipment. An ornate fountain filled with water stands in the center of the enclosure. Maintenance personnel are required to wear NBC suits while inside the containment area, and must spend 10 minutes in a special drying room after exiting. In the event of a breach, the surrounding area should be evacuated, and the enclosure flushed with liquid nitrogen. The fountain's chemical levels and volume are to be monitored and maintained. Spring water from should be used as SCP-054 is highly sensitive to hydrological conditions. SCP-054 has developed a mistrust for human males during its confinement. Thus, assignment of female personnel is recommended. Description: Out of the water, the subject most often appears as a female humanoid, with a mean volume of 90 liters comprised entirely of water. Other forms are possible, commonly geometric shapes. When it enters a body of water, it becomes indistinguishable from its surroundings. The subject must periodically return to a body of water in order to maintain its volume due to evaporation. Initially found in it was moved to Site-08 for further study. Subject was initially curious about Foundation personnel, and seemed to enjoy interacting with maintenance staff and researchers and mimicking their forms. After a number of weeks, the creature apparently felt comfortable enough to remain out of the water during routine monitoring, though it retreated when attempts were made to study its composition. SCP-054 is apparently composed of normal water, with no detectable differences compared to ordinary spring water from the same source. No thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or other phenomenon has ever been detected in its body that would suggest how it animates. Water lost by SCP-054 to evaporation exhibits no special properties when condensed. Experiments with SCP-054 were halted following data expunged to researchers injured. After this incident, containment protocols were updated. Subject thereafter exhibited signs of mistrust and aggression around male personnel, which made up the majority of the original research staff. Subject reclassified Euclid. Partial transcripts. Audio Journal 054-A Water Loss Experiment Subject becomes withdrawn and inactive when denied access to water. Its compact shape is theorized to reduce surface area exposed to evaporation. For the first few days, it moved eagerly to greet anyone entering its enclosure, and behaved excitably. Possibly indicates an understanding by the subject that we control its access to water supplies. Subject ceased this behavior yesterday presumably in recognition that no help was forthcoming. Temperature Extremes Testing We got authorization to attempt Sub-Zero testing this morning. The subject became lethargic as the temperature fell, and eventually froze completely. Spectroscopy of the ice crystal revealed no abnormalities. 
Ice chips were collected for study. This is in stark contrast to its behavior in the 95 degree tests, when it became aggressive and attempted to escape its enclosure. We've submitted a work order to combine the climate control equipment with the subject's standard enclosure, as it has begun to resist efforts to transport it to experimental chambers with increasingly desperate behavior. Memory and Conditioning Evaluation Subject has proven unexpectedly adept at navigating complex mazes and solving puzzles. Dr. Seskel has finally overcome the problem of motivating the subject by the application of electrical shocks and or silica desiccants. He joked that we should have it trained to fetch in no time, and after observing his methods, I think he might be right. Note, subject to be allowed a 48-hour recuperation period. It seemed to be lagging in its progress at the end of the week's experiments. Acid Base Incorporation Experiment Last Log Entry I am starting with a 0.5 mole hydrogen chloride solution. I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. Temperature in the enclosure has been lowered to 278 Kelvin to help control 54's increasingly erratic behavior. Addendum 054B After five years with no incidents, subject rating has been downgraded to safe. On recommendation of Dr. Experiments will resume under the auspices of Biology Unit E7. Caution should still be exercised when interacting with subject. Item Number SCP-071 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-071 is contained in a modified standard humanoid containment cell with no direct observation capabilities. Surveillance of SCP-071 may only be performed via closed-circuit video, with a minimum of 60 seconds of delay. Experimentation with SCP-071 may only be performed with permission from at least two Level 4 site directors, and personnel entering SCP-071's containment area may only do so in groups of at least four. Any personnel exhibiting unusual or compulsive behavior must be removed from the area immediately, given a full psychiatric screening, and either administered a Class C amnestic or reassigned as deemed appropriate. Under no circumstances should personnel be permitted to observe SCP-071 directly or through non-delayed surveillance footage. All visual recordings and photographs of SCP-071 must be destroyed immediately once they are no longer needed. Description SCP-071 is a metamorphic entity that possesses the ability to assume forms consistent with that of its observer's strongest sexual desire. This ability is effective even through barriers designed to prevent SCP-071's recognition of any observers, such as through closed-circuit surveillance or one-way mirrors, but can be prevented by introducing a delay in surveillance footage, so that such observation does not occur in real time. SCP-071 appears to be unable or unwilling to change form without external stimuli instead remaining in its last form when left unobserved. There appears to be little or no limit to the forms SCP-071 is capable of assuming. SCP-071 also appears to be intelligent. However, as it has not shown any ability to verbally communicate, and its behavior is limited to actions which entice its observers to sexual activity, it is unknown whether SCP-071 actually possesses sentience, or merely mimics behavior expected by its observers. Human subjects allowed to engage in sexual activity with SCP-071 suffered rapid atrophy of muscle, skeletal structure, and brain function, with onset occurring one to two days after contact. The atrophy persists for up to seven days, dependent on physical therapy administered after onset, though the subject may also suffer permanent decrease in stature, decreased organ function, decreased brain mass, and sterility. Subjects who achieve auto-gratification through masturbation via the use of media containing SCP-071, whether delayed or not, suffer the same effects. SCP-071 came to the Foundation's attention on following data expunged. Due to ongoing medical cases consistent with exposure to SCP-071, efforts to remove all visual recordings of SCP-071 from the internet are ongoing. Addendum 071-1 Researcher Note SCP-071's ability to change forms does not appear to be limited to normal human subjects. When presented with Subject D-7883, 
SCP-071 assumed the shape of a female golden retriever. D-7883 reacted with shock and refused to proceed with the experiment, though the subject's physiological signs were consistent with a state of sexual arousal. On SCP-071 assumed the form of a female human corpse when exposed to D-8762. Medical staff confirmed a complete lack of life signs, and SCP-071 suffered no harm from the transition, later assuming the form of a year old male subject when exposed to D-8765. Dr. Item number, SCP-073, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-073 is to be kept in a two-room cell, furnished with all non-organic furniture and items, and a bathroom. Subject is allowed to freely wander the facility and eat in the main canteen. A tracking device has been attached to SCP-073's person and is not to be removed. Subject is disallowed any contact with the surface and is not allowed outside the facility. Subject is allowed no contact with plant-based SCPs under any circumstances. Violence is not to be used against SCP-073 under any circumstances. SCP-073 is currently kept in Site-17. Description SCP-073 appears to be a heavily tanned male of Arabic or Middle Eastern descent in his early 30s, 185 centimeters or 6 feet and 1 inches tall, and 75 kilograms or 165 pounds, with black hair and blue eyes. Arms, legs, spinal cord, and shoulder blades of the subject appear to have been replaced with artificial versions of unknown make and metal. Subject only takes notice of this when it is pointed out and states that it has no knowledge of how, why, or when these replacements took place, stating it had them as long as it could remember. There is a symbol engraved into the forehead of the subject, which appears to be of Sumerian origin. Symbol has as of yet been untranslated and subject appears distressed when the symbol is mentioned at all, refusing to speak on it. Subject does not need to eat and drink on a regular basis, but is strictly carnivorous, owing to its effect on plant-based items. SCP-073, who refers to itself as Cain, is generally polite and genial to all who speak to it, though it has been described as being cold and somewhat mechanical in its speech. It is very helpful and enjoys aiding personnel in their daily actions, whatever they may be. It has highly detailed knowledge of ancient to recent events in history and most commonly spoken languages in the world, including ones that have since died out. Subject has professed to having a photographic memory, remembering word for word all text in an 800-page dictionary that was flicked through in a minute and a half. It has scored above average in all intelligence tests given to it. SCP-073's presence is inimical to any and all life grown in soil, causing death to any such life within a 20-meter radius. Any land SCP-073 has walked on, and any within the 20-meter radius, becomes barren as all anaerobic bacteria dies, rendering the soil incapable of supporting life until new bacteria are introduced. Anything that is derived from soil-grown life, such as wood and paper, immediately rots and disintegrates upon touch of SCP-073. Further affected derivatives include anything hydroponically grown. Violence directed towards SCP-073 reflects any damage inflicted on SCP-073 directly back onto the attacker, although SCP-073 visibly remains unharmed. This applies to any damage directed at SCP-073. Attempts to get tissue and blood samples have proven futile. When the procedure was initiated, personnel carrying out the action felt the sensation of whatever was applied to SCP-073 and wound up with a sample of their own blood or tissue. Despite the fact that all actions were directed solely at SCP-073, indirect damage through a medium also results in the person perpetrating the action receiving the wounds caused. Although SCP-073 receives no actual harm from damage to its person, it has stated that it still feels the pain of the action and has politely asked researchers to abstain from overly harmful actions to its person. Additional Notes SCP-073 was found in the New York Police Department in 19... having been taken in after subject had been found amidst the bodies of several violent gang members. SCP-073 told police members that the gang had attempted to make sport of it, but became angry 
and attempted to kill SCP-073, resulting in their own demise. SCP-073 was incarcerated and was deemed a John Doe when NYPD could not find any information on it. SCP-073 came to the attention of the Foundation through a routine inspection of John Doe's and was subsequently released into our custody. Addendum 073-1 In light of SCP-073's indestructible nature, photographic memory, and general will to please, High Command have deemed that all information is to be backed up on SCP-073, ensuring it is not lost in the event of a catastrophe. While this action has met with mixed responses, SCP-073 has agreed and sworn itself to secrecy on its part. Addendum 073-2 When information concerning SCP-076 was brought to the attention of SCP-073 for backing up, subjects showed familiarity with the information, although was disinclined to adding to it, despite the fact that it stated that it already knew all about SCP-076. It then stated it would be better for all parties involved that it not meet SCP-076. Addendum 073-3 Examination of the unidentified metal on SCP-073 has suggested that it is beryllium bronze, a metal that has been documented as being utilized by various anomalous cultures and entities. Most notably, beryllium bronze is a component found in SCP-1216, SCP-1427, SCP-2481, and SCP-2711. In light of this discovery, the Foundation began working in an attempt to trace the origin of beryllium bronze and how it initially spread throughout the world. When prompted, SCP-073 was able to provide information that suggests that beryllium bronze originated in the Middle East, though the exact point of origin has yet to be determined. Further research into the origin of beryllium bronze is currently ongoing. From Dr. To Director Maria Jones, Record Keeping and Information Security Administration Subject Revision of SCP-076 SCP File I have to go on record as saying that I seriously object to the proposed revisions of the SCP-076 Special Containment Procedures File. I know that Redact All Important Stuff Already claims it's a security risk, but you and I both know it's just top brass trying to sweep their biggest and most embarrassing mistake ever under the damn rug. Omega-7 happened. It existed. Those people died because you screwed up, and you can't change that, no matter how hard you try to hide it. For God's sake, man. Those people guarding him deserve to know exactly what he is and what he did. What we did. How we f***ed up, so they'll know better. Dr. Item Number SCP-076 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Containment Area 25B is to be located 200 meters below sea level, tunneled out of solid bedrock in a seismologically stable area. Sole access to the containment facility is to be through a vertical elevator shaft, separated every 50 meters with a reinforced blast door, constructed of 20 centimeter thick material shielding. Elevator shaft shall be flooded with seawater when not in use. Containment Area 25B is to be constructed with the following components. An outer security perimeter against outside threats, staffed by security personnel trained in close quarters battle and counter-intrusion tactics. An administrative and support area, ASA, consisting of support facilities and living quarters for on-site personnel. A primary containment zone, PCZ, consisting of a 7-meter cube encased in 1.5 meters of reinforced material. PCZ is said to be designed to be flooded and drained as needed, and should remain filled with seawater unless access to contents is required. A 150 meter killing corridor, which is to be the sole access to the PCZ from the ASA, including water, power, drainage, and ventilation lines. The walls and floor of the corridor are to be reinforced in a similar manner to the PCZ, with the addition of an electric deterrent system, capable of delivering a 20,000 volt shock. A security station located at the entrance to the killing corridor is to be staffed with no fewer than three armed security personnel on watch at any one point in time. Armament is to include, but not be limited to, at least one CIW system on a pintle mount, with a clear line of sight down the corridor, with a plexiglass screen to protect the operator from thrown weapons. In the event of a full breach, 
All on-site staff are to proceed immediately to the closest security station for weapons and armor distribution. Staff will remain at Alert Condition 1 until SCP-076-2 is confirmed and neutralized. Should 90 minutes pass after declaration of full breach without a stand-down order being given by Level 4 or higher personnel, final contingency measures will be activated, flooding the entire facility in seawater and sealing off the access shaft for a minimum of 24 hours before retrieval is attempted. This will, by necessity, result in the deaths of all on-site staff. Description: SCP-076 consists of two components, a stone cube, SCP-076-1, and a humanoid entity contained within, SCP-076-2. SCP-076-1 is a 3-meter cube made of black speckled metamorphic stone. All surfaces outside and within SCP-076-1 are covered in deeply engraved patterns, corresponding to no known civilizations. Radioisotope analysis indicates that the object is approximately 10,000 years old. A door is located on one side, sealed with a lock 0.5 meters in width, surrounded by 20 smaller locks in a circular pattern. As of yet, none of the keys have been found, making the door impossible to lock once closed. Interior temperature is approximately 93 Kelvin and cannot be altered by any means, internal or external. Directly in the center of the room is a 2.13 meter tall stone coffin, held in place and sealed shut by several chains of unknown make and substance, which are attached to the inner corners of SCP-076-1. SCP-076-2 resembles a lean Semitic human male in his late twenties. Hair is black and eyes are gray, skin tone olive. Subject is 1.96 meters in height and 81.65 kilograms in weight. Numerous tattoos depicting arcane and occult iconography are present all over the body, mostly in the form of leering demonic faces, and ranges from subtle to openly ostentatious. Subject, when encased inside SCP-076-1, is technically dead. However, occasionally SCP-076-2 will awaken, effectively reanimating, complete with all vital processes needed to sustain a living human being. Subject will then attempt to leave SCP-076-1. If successful, subject will enter a trance state and seek out the nearest human being, ignoring all other living things in the process. Upon coming into contact with living humans, SCP-076-2 will enter a rage state in which it attempts to engage and kill all human beings encountered. To date, only the subject's death has been shown to be effective in ending these rampages. Terminating SCP-076-2 is often problematic due to its significant physical abilities. Subject has superhuman strength and speed, and although not invulnerable, has shown a remarkable ability to ignore pain and shock, pressing on despite what would be debilitating wounds in normal humans. Prior encounters have shown that SCP-076-2 has the ability to, among other things, rip through a reinforced steel security door over the course of four minutes of sustained assault, clear over 64 meters of distance in under three seconds, take multiple 50 caliber BMG rounds to the head, and survive for several minutes to continue killing, despite severe damage to the cerebellum. Swat handgun and assault rifle caliber bullets out of the air with a length of steel rebar. Survive for over one hour deprived of oxygen, before finally asphyxiating. SCP-076-2's most unusual ability, however, is its ability to apparently materialize bladed weapons out of nowhere. Slow motion video footage reveals that the blades in question are actually pulled from a miniature dimensional rift, described as a small hole in space. Where this portal leads is unknown, as is how SCP-076-2 is capable of generating said rifts. Footage of the blades in question shows them to be made out of a completely non-reflective black material, appearing as a black void in space. As the blades rapidly vanish after leaving the subject's possession, no structural analysis is possible at this time. SCP-076-2 has effectively been killed several times, in various manners. Sustained fire from multiple heavy caliber machine guns. Asphyxiation. Crushed beneath a 13.6 metric ton piece of elevator equipment 
for use on SCP-076-1. Cremation through the use of a Thermate TH3 grenade, placed directly inside SCP-076-2's open chest cavity. During the worst breach to date, Containment Area 25, which previously housed SCP-076, was forced to detonate its on-site warhead as a last attempt to contain SCP-076-2 while it was attempting escape, resulting in total destruction of the site and all on-site personnel. SCP-076-1 survived. Upon death, SCP-076-2's remains will putrefy rapidly until reduced to dust. SCP-076-1 and the coffin within will then slam shut with great force, and the lock will rotate, sealing it shut. SCP-076-2 will then reform within the coffin, a process taking anywhere from 6 hours to 25 years. What posthumous analysis of SCP-076-2 exists shows that it has an internal system highly different from our own, documented in data expunged. Additional, SCP-076 was found in Mongolia in 18 by archaeologists from England. All members of the expedition were subsequently killed on the return voyage home. SCP-076 was recovered from the ship by the Society one of the organizations that later merged into the modern Global Occult Coalition, and placed on display in their inner sanctum. SCP-076 remained in storage for several years, until SCP-076-2 became active and escaped. The reason for SCP-076's activation is currently unknown, but it was at this point that the keys to the outer shell were lost. A massive manhunt lasting over three years, took place until SCP-076-2 was incapacitated by killing it and causing it to reform inside SCP-076-1, by then retrieved and secured by agents of the SCP Foundation. Subject was in custody for three more years, under constant supervision, and was terminated whenever it became active, although it occasionally was able to escape for short periods of time often due to security breaches caused by attacks from other organizations. The Foundation's death toll due to this was data expunged. After the last incident, the current procedures regarding SCP-076 were implemented, although they are upgraded regularly with the increase in technological standards. Addendum 076-2, Project ABLE, and Mobile Task Force Omega-7 All information regarding Project ABLE and Mobile Task Force Omega-7 Pandora's box is classified Q clearance by order of the O5 Council. By proceeding, you are acknowledging that you have clearance to view these files, and that you have received need-to-know permission from the appropriate Level 4 or higher authority. From Director Maria Jones, Record Keeping and Information Security Administration. To Level 4 Administrators. Subject, Reza Update to Security Protocol. Supplemental Information SCP-076 File Name Addendum 076-1 Project ABLE and Mobile Task Force Omega-7 Prior Classification 05 New Classification Level 3 Need to Know Basis Psychological Profile of Subject SCP-076-2 SCP-076-2 either possesses a mind constructed much differently than our own or is completely insane, with little empathy or ideas in a way we would understand it. Concepts such as sex, love, and equality are completely foreign ideas to SCP-076-2, or at least in comparison to its ways of viewing them. Subject has shown that it is completely disinterested in sex, barely differentiating between genders except as a form of visual identification. Also, while Subject has admitted greatly enjoying the act of killing, Causing pain, either emotionally or physically, holds no attraction to it. In short, a perfect sociopath. Intelligence tests have been wildly inconclusive when applied to SCP-076-2, and no accurate result has yet been obtained. This may be due to the alien thought processes of the subject. SCP-076-2 has, however, shown that it has great knowledge of human anatomy, although in a highly violent context. Military tactics of open warfare, metallurgy, and strangely enough, the care of livestock, 
Subject has knowledge of several languages including English, but most notable is its knowledge of several dialects of ancient Sumerian, which seem to be its preferred language. SCP-076 has nothing but contempt for human beings, with one exception. It seems to hold a wary respect for those it acknowledges as its superior. This was discovered when an agent who had previously had a large amount of experience with SCP-076-2 did not appear once it escaped. Subject seemed distressed, asking several personnel where said agent was hiding. When it finally did learn of the fate of said agent, killed as collateral damage in an airstrike intended to halt the advance of SCP-076-2 SCP stopped its rampage and allowed itself to be escorted and restrained. Subject was then interviewed on the sudden drastic changes in its behavior. Begin log. Doctor, why are you so interested in the death of Agent SCP-076-2 Subject begins swearing in ancient Sumerian. Doctor, why does his death bother you? You've killed many humans before. Why is he so? Is cut off by SCP-076-2. SCP-076-2, now speaking in English. Different? Because, unlike you, Sumerian word untranslated, he was a challenge, a real enemy. Doctor, why would that be good for you? Every time you have awoken, you've tried to escape. He was responsible for apprehending you several times. Surely you must be glad he's dead. SCP-076-2, I would hardly expect you to understand. Do you know, he managed to shoot me in the head numerous times. A man like that deserves to die in combat, so close to his opponent he can feel his breath. Not in some, Sumerian words untranslated, destruction, ordered by cowardly kings and princes safe in their palaces. The rest of you, SCP-076-2 spits. You disgust me. I don't even have the urge to strike you down. Subject is silent from then on, refusing to speak or respond. End log. This indicates a possible psychological inlet into SCP-076-2's mind and a possible control mechanism. Given the massive drain on resources SCP-076-2 causes due to its escape attempts, and considering Bowie Commission's stated desire to weaponize SCP objects for tactical purposes, I recommend that we pursue this course of action as soon as possible. Dr. P.G. From Dr. To Dr. P.G. Project Omega-7. Subject. He said yes. Dr. Project Proposal. Mobile Task Force Omega-7. Pandora's Box. Mission Statement. Support of SCP-076-2. Able. In the field. In high-risk tactical situations. Task Force Organization. Task Force Special Asset Able. Task Force Leader. 10 to 20 field agents divided into 5 teams of 3 to 5 each. Members of the team are to be personally selected from elite field agents by Subject Abel himself, in order to maintain a smooth relationship between the artifact and the mundane elements of the task force. Security Protocol SCP-076-2 Abel is to wear a device attached to the neck that, if triggered or tampered with, will immediately detonate terminating SCP-076-2 by way of complete destruction of the spinal cord, trachea, and all major blood vessels in the neck. A tracking device has also been attached to SCP-076-2's person. It is to refrain from killing unless ordered to do so, and is to avoid causing damage to the organization's facilities. Armament and Equipment Team members are to be armed and equipped in accordance with MTF doctrine. As Subject Able has shown no inclination to use firearms, or in fact, no understanding of their use or tactical implications, he is instead to be armed with one or more edged melee weapons of his choice. Addendum For God's sake, find these guys something to do. Abel's getting bored, and he started putting his team through live fire exercises. They get bullets. He gets training weapons. Have you ever seen someone break a man's jaw using a Nerf sword? He's not going to stop until someone gets killed. Dr. Report by Dr. PG, Project Omega-7. In light of SCP-076-2's proficient use of the Sumerian language, researchers have asked it to translate several documents. While it originally replied with disinterest, it has translated some of the documents it found worthy of its attention. 
Most of the documents chosen by SCP-076-2 were regarding battles or legendary heroes, one of its favorites in particular being the Epic of Gilgamesh. However, one researcher presented it with a symbol from SCP-073. Upon sight of this, SCP-076-2 became highly enraged, killing several of the researchers before its kill switch could be activated. When revived and questioned about this, SCP-076-2 responded aggressively, and that line of questioning was immediately dropped. It is recommended anything pertaining SCP-073 never be brought to the attention of SCP-076-2, and that the two are never to be in the same facility. Addendum 076-07 Recently, SCP-105 has been accepted into Mobile Task Force Omega-7, having beaten SCP-076-2 in a contest to see which of the two can activate several devices, each spaced over a mile away from each other in the starting point. SCP-105 managed to score significantly higher than SCP-076-2 by using her inherent abilities to her advantage. SCP-076-2 seeded defeat and allowed her entry into the group. Addendum 076-09 Proposed introduction of SCP-076-2 to SCP-682 put on indefinite hold. Those with security clearance level 4 or higher may request access to Contingency 076-2 Number 3. Addendum 076-23 Per the request of the Bowie Commission, Mobile Task Force Omega-7 is to be fielded and data expunged. From Dr. To Dr. P.G. Project Omega-7 Subject don't do it, P. For God's sake, don't do it. It's bad enough that they're trying to weaponize Iris, too. Don't let the military bully us into doing their dirty work against some sand farmers. Dr. From General Bowie to Dr. PG, Project Omega-7. Subject, a job well done. Excellent work, Doctor. The mission went exactly as expected. We'll be calling you again if we need your help. General Bowie. From Dr. To Dr. PG, Project Omega-7. Subject, I hope you're f***ing proud of yourself, mother because you're a bigger a**hole than this guy. From Dr. PG, Project Omega-7. To Omega-7 Team. Subject, reassignment. As of this moment, Dr. has been reassigned to SCP-682 as Level 1 personnel. Data expunged. From Dr. P.G., Project Omega-7, to General Bowie, Subject, Problems. Despite our best efforts, Subject Abel is proving difficult to control. All our attempts to keep him engaged have been more or less unsuccessful. The problem is, he's a perfect killing machine, and that's all he wants to do. Which seems like exactly what we wanted, but the problem is, we can't seem to turn him off. I'm running out of missions to give him and the ones I've got left aren't engaging him mentally. He's starting to lash out at the other team members. It's only a matter of time before something goes wrong. Requesting permission to discontinue the project and neutralize Abel temporarily, until we can find something more for him to do. From General Bowie to Dr. PG, Project Omega-7. Subject regarding problems. Unacceptable. Neutralizing Subject Abel at this point is going to cause us an unacceptable delay. We'll have another mission for you within a couple of weeks. All you have to do is keep him busy until then. Send him on vacation or something. From Dr. PG, Project Omega-7. To all staff. Subject, alert. This is an automated alert. SCP-076-2 has disabled the explosive collar failsafe and gone out of control. All staff to high alert. Further requests as events warrant. From... Automated Defense System, Containment Area 25. Two, all sites. Subject, final option engaged. This is an automated message. Do not reply. As of Containment Area 25 has engaged its on-site nuclear warhead on 10-minute countdown. From O5 Command. Two, all sites. Subject, Containment Area 25 final option. Response. Containment Area 25 has been destroyed by detonation of its on-site nuclear warhead. Sites 67 and 68 are to activate the FEMA protocol and secure the location as soon as possible. Official cover story will be released by RISA to all personnel once drafted. 
Revised Psychological Profile of Subject SCP-076-2 SCP-076-2 either possesses a mind constructed much differently than our own, or is completely insane, with little empathy or ideas in a way we would understand it. Concepts such as sex, love, and equality are completely foreign ideas to SCP-076-2, or at least in comparison to its way of viewing them. The subject has shown that it is completely disinterested in sex, barely differentiating between genders except as a form of visual identification. Also, while subject seems to greatly enjoy the act of killing, causing pain, either emotionally or physically, holds no attraction to it. Intelligence tests have been wildly inconclusive when applied to SCP-076-2, and no accurate result has yet been obtained. This is due to the fact that no communication is possible with the subject when in its rage state. Subject displays knowledge of several languages, including English, but most notable is its knowledge of several dialects of ancient Sumerian, which seem to be its preferred language. SCP-076 has nothing but contempt for human beings, and will kill them on sight. No communication is to be attempted with the subject. End Mobile Task Force Omega-7 Incident Log Item Number SCP-082 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Enlarged living quarters located at Armed Biocontainment Area 14 have been appropriated for the suppression and appeasement of SCP-082. While standard weapons have little effect in policing SCP-082, cooperation is easily attained through a charade. Subject is currently under the impression that it has been made the King of France and that its containment area is actually a grand palace, designed for its protection. All interacting personnel are to be made aware of this charade, and are ordered to follow the ruse. Housekeeping personnel are to be Class D personnel only. Guards tasked with the containment of SCP-082 are to be given Level 2 clearance, but are instructed to refrain from interacting directly with SCP-082. Description: SCP-082 is genetically human. However, through some process, either chemical, hormonal, cancerous, or supernatural, SCP-082 has grown to giant proportions. Approximately 2.4 meters tall, around 8 feet, and weighing over 310 kilograms, about 700 pounds, SCP-082's physical characteristics are grossly disproportional. It has a slightly pointed balding head, a large rounded chin and jaw, a bulbous nose, and dark, sunken eyes. Subject is both overweight and possesses a great amount of muscle mass. Forearms are muscular and dangerous, with a circumference of about 71 centimeters, or about 28 inches. The breadth of the subject's fist is nearly 30 centimeters along the knuckles, almost 12 inches. Though feet are large, they are small in proportion to subject's body, men's size 14 US. Subject's skin is tanned dark, and overall physical appearance is compounded by numerous scars, the results of years of attempts at suppression and containment. Most x-rays have been difficult to interpret because of the high density of its muscle tissue, but scans have revealed countless bullets and even several knife and sword blades lodged in SCP-082's flesh. SCP-082 refers to itself as Fernand and speaks fluent French and heavily accented English. When it speaks, it does so through enormous clenched teeth. SCP-082 only parts teeth to eat food and to sing. Subject will sing songs of its own pleasing, ranging from forgotten Victoria-era bar songs to modern classical, typically while cooking and eating. SCP-082 does not comb the hair on the sides of its head, but does cut it and shaves with a large butcher knife originally provided for food preparation. It should be noted that even facial hair is exaggerated, a single strand being as thick as a millimeter, similar in thickness and appearance to graphite of a mechanical pencil. Occasionally, SCP-082 will clench its teeth so hard that the gums bleed, but it is not known why. This is considered normal. The demeanor of SCP-082 is very amicable and carefree. SCP-082 has accrued a wide wardrobe over its time of incarceration, and it enjoys dressing up in many different fashions, including formal wear, military uniform, as a clown, and in women's clothing. 
New pieces should be made available upon request. Subject often attempts to joke and is usually polite to personnel, often inviting them to dinner. However, visiting personnel should be aware that at any moment, SCP-082 is capable of attacking and voraciously eating others. Subject will often apologize for its lack of manners for interrupting someone's conversation by devouring their head while making a mess of his quarters. SCP-082's jaw is strong enough to crack bone, and it seems to enjoy skulls. Attacks are seemingly at random, with no motivation. Whether or not subject has recently eaten has no effect on this cannibalistic hunger. SCP-082 is incapable of differentiating fact from fiction when he reads it or watches television or films. On several occasions, SCP-082 has expressed a great desire to meet his favorite person, Hannibal Lecter, and Subject will believe that all television programming is some form of reality television. Though Subject has shown heightened intelligence in the form of memory and puzzle solving, the concepts of parody, satire, and fiction are beyond its understanding. SCP-082 apparently understands the concept of lying, has shown to know when others are blatantly lying, and generally tells obvious falsehoods when asked about its past. According to SCP-082, he is a vampire, a homunculus, Big Bird, Andre the Giant, Napoleon, Obelix, sidekick of Asterix, Dr. Bright, The Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster. When questioned about these lies, he gives the excuse, but I only lie when it's through my teeth. Item number, SCP-088, Object Class, Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-088 is to remain sealed in its airtight case at all times. The case is constructed of transparent acrylic plastic to resist the corrosive properties of SCP-088 secretions. In the event that SCP-088 should awaken from hibernation, any room that it is stored within should be constructed of durable plastics, rubber, or ceramics to hinder its ability to escape. Temperature of SCP-088's containment should not exceed 15 degrees Celsius, and any personnel entering containment must observe Level 4 hazardous material protocols and wear the appropriate protective gear at all times. Any personnel who do not observe proper containment protocols in presence of SCP-088, or who show signs of physical mutation, are to be demoted to D-Class and held for observation. Description: SCP-088 is a humanoid with reptilian features, which appear to have been mummified in a languid posture. However, SCP-088 is merely in a state of hibernation from which it may recover if it is again exposed to a more hospitable environment than its current containment. Research has indicated that SCP-088 is approximately 6,000 years old and is capable of secreting a variety of hazardous biological compounds from its mouth and hands. Some of these substances could be of great strategic value if replicated, but until a means to extract them without awakening SCP-088 is found, research into this area is on hold. SCP-088 was recovered with the mummified remains of 23 beings, sharing a similar morphology. However, none of these beings were alive, and examination suggests that they were originally human. Information obtained by Agents E-088-3 and E-088-7 and their subsequent mutation due to SCP-088 exposure corroborates this theory. Addendum SCP-088 was recovered in 1930 from a subterranean complex below Los Angeles, California. The site was originally discovered by GWS using a device he called a radio X-ray, which was little more than a mechanical dowsing rod. While S's methods were dubious, his discovery was not. After mapping a series of tunnels and gold deposits below the city, S declared that he had found the lost city of the Lizard People as described in the legends of Arizona's Hopi tribe. S's claims went as far as to be featured on the front page of the Los Angeles Times on January 29, 1934, before the Foundation was able to verify his claims and silence Mr. S. The subterranean complex was not nearly as extensive as described in legend, and most of the artifacts recovered within were too corroded to provide significant information, 
save for a long message carved into the rock wall of an unfinished tunnel. Containment Breach Overview In more than 70 years of containment, SCP-088 has only roused from its state of hibernation twice, breaching containment with a caustic fluid that dissolves most minerals and metals. Each time, multiple personnel were exposed to a second compound, which SCP-088 uses to propagate itself. Affected personnel underwent a painful mutation, after which they shared the physical characteristics of SCP-088. Those few who received a large dosage of the compound, administered directly via mouth-to-mouth -mouth contact, were changed the fastest, and subsequently sacrificed themselves to protect SCP-088 from harm. SCP-088 has also demonstrated the ability to produce potent neurotoxins in liquid and gaseous form to combat containment personnel. Containment during the second breach was re-achieved by isolating SCP-088 and affected personnel in the facility and lowering the temperature. Affected personnel built a pedestal from discarded equipment, upon which SCP-088 took a recumbent position before slipping back into hibernation. The mutated personnel were neutralized at this point, and SCP-088 was returned to containment. The current strategy of lower temperature and non-metallic containment has been successful in keeping SCP-088 isolated. SCP-088 was reclassified to safe status on November 19... Item Number SCP-096 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-096 is to be contained in its cell, a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter airtight steel cube, at all times. Weekly checks for any cracks or holes are mandatory. There are to be absolutely no video surveillance or optical tools of any kind inside SCP-096's cell. Security personnel will use pre-installed pressure sensors and laser detectors to ensure SCP-096's presence inside the cell. Any and all photos, video, or recordings of SCP-096's likeness are strictly forbidden without approval from Dr. and O5. Description SCP-096 is a humanoid creature, measuring approximately 2.38 meters in height. Subject shows very little muscle mass, with preliminary analysis of body mass suggesting mild malnutrition. Arms are grossly out of proportion with the rest of the subject's body, with an approximate length of 1.5 meters each. Skin is mostly devoid of pigmentation, with no sign of any body hair. SCP-096's jaw can open to four times the norm of an average human. Other facial features remain similar to an average human, with the exception of the eyes, which are also devoid of pigmentation. It is not yet known whether SCP-096 is blind or not. It shows no signs of any higher brain functions, and is not considered to be sapient. SCP-096 is normally extremely docile with pressure sensors inside its cell indicating it spends most of the day pacing by the eastern wall. However, when someone views SCP-096's face, whether it be directly, via video recording, or even a photograph, it will enter a stage of considerable emotional distress. SCP-096 will cover its face with its hands and begin screaming, crying, and babbling incoherently. Approximately one to two minutes after the first viewing, SCP-096 will begin running to the person who viewed its face, who will from this point on be referred to as SCP-096-1. Documented speeds have varied from 35 kilometers an hour to kilometers an hour, and seems to depend on distance from SCP-096-1. At this point, no known material or method can impede SCP-096's progress. The actual position of SCP-096-1 does not seem to affect SCP-096's response. It seems to have an innate sense of SCP-096-1's location. Note, this reaction does not occur when viewing artistic depictions. Upon arriving at SCP-096-1's location, SCP-096 will proceed to kill and data expunged SCP-096-1. 100% of cases have left no traces of SCP-096-1. SCP-096 will then sit down for several minutes before regaining its composure and becoming docile once again. It will then attempt to make its way back to its natural habitat. Due to the possibility of a mass chain reaction, 
including breach of Foundation secrecy and large civilian loss of life. Retrieval of subjects should be considered alpha priority. Dr. has also petitioned for an immediate termination of SCP-096. Termination order has been approved. Audio log from Interview 096-1 Interviewer Dr. Interviewed Captain Retired Former Commander of Retrieval Team Zulu 9A Retrieval Incident 096-1A Begin Log Captain It always sucks ass to get initial retrieval duty. You have no idea what the damn thing is capable of, besides what jacked up information the field techies can scrape up. And you're lucky if they even tell you the whole story. They told us to bag and tag. Didn't tell us jack shit about not looking at the damn thing. Doctor, could you describe the mission, please? Captain, yeah, sorry. We had two choppers, one with my team, and one on backup with the Zulu 9B and Dr. We spotted the target about two clicks north of our patrol path. I'm guessing he wasn't facing our direction, else he would have taken us out then and there. Doctor, your report says SCP-096 didn't react to the cold? It was minus degrees Celsius. Captain, actually, it was minus And yes, it was butt naked and didn't so much as shiver. Anyway, we landed, approached the target, and Corporal got ready to bag it. That's when the doctor called. I turned to answer it, and that's what saved me. The target must have turned, and my whole squad saw it. Doctor, that's when SCP-096 entered an agitated emotional state. Captain, yep, sorry, got the willies for a second. Doctor, that's all right. Captain, yeah, well, I never saw its face. My squad did, and they paid for it up the ass. Doctor, could you describe it a little more, please? Captain. Yeah, yeah. It started screaming at us and crying. Not animal roaring, though. Sounded exactly like a person. Really f***ing creepy. We started firing when it picked up Corporal and ripped off his leg. God, he was screaming for our help. F***ing A. Anyway, we were blowing chunks out of the target, round after round. Didn't do jack sh I almost lost it when it started data expunged him. Doctor, that's when you ordered the use of an AT-4 HEDT launcher. Captain, an anti-tank gun. Started carrying it ever since SCP got loose. I've seen those tear through tanks like tissue paper. Did the same thing to the target. Doctor, there was significant damage to SCP-096? Captain, it didn't even f***ing flinch. It kept tearing apart my squad but with half of its torso gone. He draws a large half circle across his torso. Doctor, but it was taking damage. Captain, if it was, it wasn't showing it. It must have lost all its organs, all its blood, but it didn't acknowledge any of it. Its bone structure wasn't hurt at all though. It kept tearing my squad apart. Doctor, so no actual structural damage. How many rounds would you say were fired at SCP-096? Captain, at the least, a thousand. Our door gunner kept his GAU-19 on it for at least 20 seconds. 20 f***ing seconds. That's 650 caliber rounds pumped into the thing. Might as well have been spitting at it. Doctor, this is when Zulu-9B arrived. Captain, yeah, and my squad was gone. Zulu-9B managed to get the bag over its head, and it just sat down. We got it into the chopper and got it here. I don't know how I never saw its face. Maybe God or Buddha or whoever thought I should live. The jackass. Doctor, we have obtained an artist's depiction of SCP-096's face. Would you like to view it? Captain, pauses. You know, after hearing that thing's screams and the screams of my men, I don't think I want to put a face to what I heard. No. Just... No. Doctor, alright, I believe we are done here. Thank you, Captain. Chairs are heard moving, and footsteps leave the room. Captain is confirmed to have left interview room 22. Doctor, let this be on record that I am formally requesting SCP-096 be terminated as soon as possible. End log. Documentation 096-1 of Experiment 096-1. Experiment 096-1 is headed by Dr. Dan. 
purpose is to test SCP-096's abilities while obtaining complete physical description of SCP-096. D-9031 is a 32-year-old convicted felon and former tattoo artist. D-9031 is placed inside Bathyspear 303A, which is then lowered into the Tonga Trench off the coast of New Zealand. The following was recorded via video surveillance inside Bathyspear 303A between it and Dr. Dan's control site on the New Zealand mainland. Bathyspear 303A reaches final depth of 10,800 meters. D-9031. It's stopped. What now? Dr. Dan. Do you feel fine? No sickness? Anything? D-9031. My ears hurt. Dr. Dan. That should be expected. Now, on your left should be a steel container. Open it, and there will be a manila folder holding several photographs. Open it and describe the first photograph, please. D-9031 complies. The camera is located so the photograph cannot be seen. D-9031. Nothing. It's an empty cell. Dr. Dan. Thank you. Please set this photograph down in the receptacle to your right and look at the next photograph. D-9031. It's the same cell, but there's a foot in it, I think. Dr. Dan. Describe it, please. D-9031. Uh, it's pale and bony. Sort of creepy, actually. Dr. Dan. Place the photograph in the receptacle, face down, and look at the next one. D-9031. Okay. Pause. Oh, shit. Dr. Dan. Describe the photograph. D-9031. It's a... I don't know, some creepy person. Dr. Dan, describe the photograph, please. D-9031. Hell, man. He's pale, has white eyes, and something f***ed up is happening with his mouth. What the hell is this thing? At this point, approximately 1332 standard time, Dr. Dan and Experiment Control is notified that SCP-096 has breached containment. The fastest path to SCP-096-1 has been cleared of civilians and other image capturing devices and SCP-096 is now being tracked by satellites via tracking collar. Dr. Dan, on your right there should be another steel container. Open it. SCP-096-1. It's a pad of paper and a pencil. Dr. Dan, yes. Please draw a sketch of the photograph you saw. SCP-096-1 mumbles an expletive and spends the next 20 minutes drawing a sketch of the photograph. At the time of completion, SCP-096 is confirmed to be kilometers away from SCP-096-1. SCP-096-1. I'm done. Dr. Dan. Good. Place the drawing in the receptacle on your left and close the door. SCP-096-1 complies and the sketch leaves Bathyspear 303A in a watertight buoyancy container. The other photographs are then incinerated in the onboard incinerator. SCP-096-1. What now? Dr. Dan. Please stand by. 40 minutes pass. SCP-096 is now confirmed to be at SCP-096-1's position and is diving. Transponder signal ends at 9,339 meters as pressure goes beyond the device's operational limits. The camera shows the bathysphere shaking slightly. From SCP-096-1's reaction, it is assumed SCP-096 is on the hull and is visible through the viewport. SCP-096-1. Oh, f***. Shit, shit, shit. What the f*** is that? Video and audio feed is cut as the hull of Bathyspear 303A is breached. SCP-096 is recovered by Surface Recovery Team Foxtrot 303A without incident. Sketch of SCP-096 is also recovered and a quick test confirms no hostile reaction from SCP-096. Sketch is sent to experiment control on New Zealand, while SCP-096 is moved to permanent containment. Item Number SCP-106 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Revision 11-8 No physical interaction with SCP-106 is allowed at any time. All physical interaction must be approved by no less than a two-thirds vote from O5 Command. 
Any such interaction must be undertaken in AR-2 maximum security sites, after a general non-essential staff evacuation. All staff, research security, class D, etc., are to remain at least 60 meters away from the containment cell at all times, except in the event of breach events. SCP-106 is to be contained in a sealed container comprised of lead-lined steel. The container will be sealed within 40 layers of identical material, each layer separated by no less than 36 centimeters of empty space. Support struts between layers are to be randomly spaced. Container is to remain suspended, no less than 60 centimeters from any surface, by ELO IID electromagnetic supports. Secondary containment area is to be comprised of 16 spherical cells, each filled with various fluids and a random assembly of surfaces and supports. Secondary containment is to be fitted with light systems, capable of flooding the entire assembly with no less than 80,000 lumens of light instantly, with no direct human involvement. Both containment areas are to remain under 24-hour surveillance. Any corrosion observed on any containment cell surfaces, staff members, or other site locations within 200 meters of SCP-106 are to be reported to site security immediately. Any objects or personnel lost to SCP-106 are to be deemed missing or KIA. No recovery attempts are to be made under any circumstances. Note, continued research and observation have shown that, when faced with highly complex or random assemblies of structures, SCP-106 can be confused, showing a marked delay on entry and exit from said structure. SCP-106 has also shown an aversion to direct, sudden light. This is not manifested in any form of physical damage, but a rapid exit to the pocket dimension generated on solid surfaces. These observations, along with those of lead aversion and liquid confusion, have reduced the general escape incidence by 43%. The primary cells have also been effective in recovery incidents requiring recall protocol. Observation is ongoing. Description. SCP-106 appears to be an elderly humanoid with a general appearance of advanced decomposition. This appearance may vary, but the rotting quality is observed in all forms. SCP-106 is not exceptionally agile and will remain motionless for days at a time, waiting for prey. SCP-106 is also capable of scaling any vertical surface and can remain suspended upside down indefinitely. When attacking, SCP-106 will attempt to incapacitate prey by damaging major organs, muscle groups, or tendons, then pull disabled prey into its pocket dimension. SCP-106 appears to prefer human prey items in the 10 to 25 years of age bracket. SCP-106 causes a corrosion effect in all solid matter it touches, engaging a physical breakdown in materials several seconds after contact. This is observed as rusting, rotting, and cracking of materials in the creation of a black, mucus-like substance, similar to the material coating SCP-106. This effect is particularly detrimental to living tissues and is assumed to be a pre-digestion action. Corrosion continues for six hours after contact, after which the effect appears to burn out. SCP-106 is capable of passing through solid matter leaving behind a large patch of its corrosive mucus. SCP-106 is able to vanish inside solid matter, entering what is assumed to be a form of pocket dimension. SCP-106 is then able to exit this dimension from any point connected to the initial entry point. Examples, entering the inner wall of a room and exiting the outer wall, entering a wall and exiting from the ceiling. It is unknown if this is the point of origin for SCP-106, or a simple lair created by SCP-106. Limited observation of this pocket dimension has shown it to be comprised mostly of halls and rooms, with data expunged entry. This activity can continue for days, with some subjected individuals being released for the express purpose of hunting, recapture, data expunged. Addendum SCP Review Notes Due to the exceedingly difficult to contain nature of SCP-106, SCP is to be reviewed every three months or during a post-breach incident. Physical restraints are impossible, and direct physical damage appears to have no effect on SCP-106. 
current SCP revolves around basic observation and immediate response. Previous, more proactive special containment procedures have been recalled due to the events of breaches. Notes on Behavior SCP-106 appears to go through long periods of dormancy, in which it will remain completely motionless for up to three months. The cause for this is unknown. However, it has been shown that this appears to be used as a lulling tactic. SCP-106 will emerge from this state in a very agitated state, and will attack and abduct staff and cause gross damage to its containment cell on the site at large. Recall Protocol Data Expunged SCP-106 appears to hunt and attack based on desire, not hunger. SCP-106 will attack and collect multiple prey items during a hunting behavior event, keeping many alive in the pocket dimension for extended periods of time. SCP-106 has no determinable limit and appears to collect a random number of prey items during an event. The inner dimension accessed by SCP-106 appears to be only accessible by SCP-106. Recording and transmission devices have been shown to still operate inside this dimension, though recordings and transmissions are very degraded. It appears that SCP-106 will play with captured prey and appears to have full control of time, space, and perception inside this dimension. SCP-106 appears data expunged. Recall Protocol In the event of a breach event by SCP-106, a human within the 10 to 25 years of age bracket will be prepped for recall, with the compromised containment cell being replaced and restored for use. When the cell is ready, the lore subject will be injured, preferably via the breakage of a long bone, such as the femur, or the severing of a major tendon, such as the Achilles tendon. Lore subject will then be placed in the prepped cell and the sound emitted by said subject will be transmitted over the site public address system. SCP-106 will typically begin to gravitate toward the lore subject within 10 to 15 minutes after hearing the subject. Should SCP-106 not respond to the initial broadcast, additional physical trauma is to be administered to lure the subject at 25 minute intervals until SCP-106 responds. Multiple lore subjects may be used in the case of major breach events. SCP-106 will typically enter a dormant state after finishing with a lore subject. In addition, subjects may data expunged. Item Number SCP-138 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-138 requires minimal containment procedures. For humanitarian purposes, subject is currently being kept in a chemically induced comatose state. Description SCP-138 is a human male, suspected to be in excess of 4,000 years old. Subject is approximately 1.5 meters in height, emaciated, and wizened. SCP-138's precise origins are unknown. Subject was discovered in 2006 in an Egyptian tomb located near Tutankhamun's tomb unearthed in 1922, sealed inside a sarcophagus. When a living being was discovered in the tomb, the Foundation was alerted by one of our sleeper agents assigned to the International Archaeological Association. Subject was immediately moved to Sector 37 for investigation by the lead research science team there. Physiologically, SCP-138 should, clinically, be dead. Muscles and internal organs are in a severe state of atrophy, and although the subject's bioelectromagnetic field is stable, his nervous system is also severely debilitated. Subject also exhibits evidence of a large number of fatal wounds, some possibly accidental, some blatantly deliberate, whether inflicted by the subject himself or by others. There is no obvious scientific explanation for his continued living state. Although other SCPs have exhibited accelerated regenerative properties, allowing them to resist death, SCP-138 has no such abilities. His body does not regenerate damage, but simply continues to function despite lethal injuries. This stretches to wounding blows, although anything that would completely destroy the body proves ineffective. Subject speaks exclusively in a dialect of ancient Egyptian. Communication using a civilian translator has revealed very little about the subject's past, though it would appear that he was buried in the tomb for an unknown religious purpose. Due to his severely injured state, 
SCP-138 is in a constant state of agony and has on numerous occasions insistently requested humanitarian euthanasia. No successful method of termination has yet been found, despite various and varied attempts, both official and unsanctioned. Attached is a comprehensive list of the subject's injuries. Document 138-27 Injuries sustained by subject SCP-138 Ancient injuries Slit throat 17 separate wounds to the torso 9 sword wounds 6 spear wounds and 2 wounds caused by unknown puncturing weapon, possibly a metal or wooden spike. Sanctioned euthanasia attempts Severe nausea due to intravenous arsenic poison. Third degree burns to 100% of the subject's body. Note that SCP-138 survived a full 20 minutes in an industrial incinerator. Severe internal and nervous system damage from electrocution attempt. Unofficial euthanasia attempts by non-research personnel. Tracheal trauma due to extended strangulation attempt. Two gunshot wounds to the head causing severe cranial trauma. Item number SCP-172 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Any personnel wishing to access SCP-172 must receive written approval and undergo a one-hour training session. All interaction with SCP-172 must be overseen by at least one Class 4 operative who may end the session at their discretion. Any and all records, drawings, or correspondence produced by SCP-172 are to be submitted immediately to Dr. for review. Reasonable requests made by SCP-172 are to be granted after approval by said doctor. SCP-172 is to be allowed out of its containment area with approval, as long as it is accompanied by an armed Class 4 operative. Armed personnel are to be stationed at the door of SCP-172. Should SCP-172 attempt to escape, it is to first be asked to cease and desist, and then led back to its containment area. Containment area is to be kept stocked with paper, pencils, and any additional components requested by SCP-172. Tables, chairs, and any additional furnishings requested by SCP-172 are to be provided pending approval by Dr. Upon entering its dormant state, SCP-172 should be placed in its transportation box until rewound. Description SCP-172 appears to be a human being, 34 years of age, 185 centimeters or 6 foot 1 inches tall, black hair and mustache, 175.5 kilograms or 386 pounds, and of Russian descent. SCP-172's personality is very friendly and intelligent, if somewhat dull and repetitive. SCP-172 prefers dress from the 1860s and always wears a large ornate key on a long necklace. SCP-172 has never identified itself by any name and is not upset by being referred to by its designation number. Internally, SCP-172 is a staggeringly complex automaton possessing over 2 million moving parts and 18 million components at last count. Component parts appear to be made of glass, silk, wood, steel, brass, rubber, and several other substances. Similarity between this construction and that of SCP-2776 suggests a similar creator or creators. SCP-172 also has several modules that can be installed via a hatch in its chest. These appear to alter behavior, speech, movement, and several parameters based on position in the body cavity and module components. SCP-172 has 46 modules at current count, having built three of these while in Foundation custody. Currently, SCP-172 is loaded with the Engineer module. Modules have been identified by SCP-172 as Caretaker, Soldier, Medic, Mother, and King, though this is by no means a comprehensive list. Under no circumstances are modules to be replaced without O5 level authorization. SCP-172 is powered via a mainspring, which is wound with the key in SCP-172's possession, 
after inserting it into a hole at the base of the neck. SCP-172 can operate for eight hours on a single full windup. SCP-172 appears wholly human when in operation and is capable of all basic human functions. SCP-172 has no need to eat, breathe, or sleep, but will perform all these functions if allowed to do so. SCP-172 is extremely obedient and will follow any instructions given to it to the best of its ability. SCP-172 does not view its existence as strange and asserts that it is human, even when shown its internal components. SCP-172 is also extremely delicate and great care must be taken to preserve and maintain its function. SCP-172 has also shown a level of mechanical skill nothing short of miraculous. SCP-172 is capable of analyzing and copying any mechanical device it comes in contact with. This was first shown when it became apparent that locks of any kind cannot contain SCP-172. It has also made several copies or upgraded versions of SCP technology, all based on incredibly complex clockwork. Most notably, data expunged. Document number 172-4R. Notes on recovery of SCP-172. SCP-172 was recovered after the Great War, in a chamber below a former vacation home of the Tsars. Exposed due to stray bombing, the chamber and its contents were badly damaged, but SCP-172 was found intact in an iron crate, along with many modules and its key. Item was removed by operatives and wound up inside testing facilities. SCP-172 appeared to wake up from a deep sleep and proceeded to greet everyone present in Russian. When Agent shouted in surprise, SCP-172 pushed against its chest and repeated its greetings in English. SCP-172, when questioned, stated that its last memory was playing with a young boy. The boy left, and SCP-172 began to feel very tired so it returned to the box. It has no memory of its creation, creator, or name. Item Number SCP-173 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Item SCP-173 is to be kept in a locked container at all times. When personnel must enter SCP-173's container, no fewer than three may enter at any time, and the door is to be relocked behind them. At all times, two persons must maintain direct eye contact with SCP-173 until all personnel have vacated and relocked the container. Description: Moved to Site-19 in 1993. Origin is as of yet unknown. It is constructed from concrete and rebar with traces of Krylon brand spray paint. SCP-173 is animate and extremely hostile. The object cannot move while within a direct line of sight. Line of sight must not be broken at any time with SCP-173. Personnel assigned to enter container are instructed to alert one another before blinking. Object is reported to attack by snapping the neck at the base of the skull or by strangulation. In the event of an attack, personnel are to observe Class 4 Hazardous Object Containment Procedures. Personnel report sounds of scraping stone originating from within the container when no one is present inside. This is considered normal, and any change in this behavior should be reported to the acting HMCL supervisor on duty. The reddish-brown substance on the floor is a combination of feces and blood. Origin of these materials is unknown. The enclosure must be cleaned on a bi-weekly basis. Item Number SCP-179 Object Class Thaumiel Special Containment Procedures SCP-179 remains beyond the reach of currently known groups of interest, including the Foundation. All containment efforts are to be focused towards a Grade 3 omission cover-up coupled with the discouragement or sabotage of exploration and research missions that attempt to study cis-Mercurian space and orbits that go through it. Description SCP-179 is a humanoid entity 
located at a constant distance of approximately 40,000 kilometers from the south polar region of the solar photosphere, locked to the rotation axis of Sol. However, it does not orbit it. The most recent recordings of SCP-179 indicate that it seems to maintain a continuous orbit around the center of the galaxy. Through the combined effort of 43 years of continuous surveying, the external appearance of SCP-179 has been defined as a human female of undetermined ethnic group of between 20 and 40 years of age. Its entire bodily surface is covered in or composed of a matte black material. Its hair appears to be composed of this material, measures over 34 kilometers long, and is constantly pushed away by solar wind. However, this part of SCP-179 seems to reflect variable amounts of sunlight, this reflection being the phenomenon that indicated its existence to Foundation astrophysicists during 1940. Several markings or tattoos are placed throughout its bodily midline. Judging from their brightness, these markings might be of metallic composition and of a golden hue. These tattoos include several symbols that have been identified as those typically representing the Sun and the six innermost planets of the solar system, according to medieval alchemy, including in this order. The symbol of gold on the subject's forehead, right underneath the hairline. The symbol of mercury under the nose, circling both lips. The symbol of copper between the medial ends of its clavicles. Data expunged. Auto sensor level SC4. Non trivial cognito hazard detected, with the anatomically correct shape of a human heart, placed over the location where a heart would be, in a female human of the same apparent age and bodily proportions. The symbol of iron in the upper abdominal region. The symbol of tin in the lower abdominal region part of a final symbol in the pelvic region. While the anatomy of this region makes its clear observation difficult, it has been hypothesized that the symbol of lead is also present and complete in the perineum region. SCP-179 keeps its ventral side oriented towards Earth most of the time, but it has been observed to look towards other areas on occasion. All further data redacted, as per Administrative Warning ES-026. Administrative Warning ES-026 As of SCP-179 has been reclassified Thaumiel. All involved personnel with a clearance level below 4-179 will be either promoted or reassigned to fit this new classification, depending on their relevance for the continued surveillance and cover-up operations as directed by the current head researcher for SCP-179. All reassigned personnel will be subject to Polymath 8 Memory Redaction Therapy, or D-Class Amnestics, in a high dosage grade, with a maximum retrograde effect of 10 years of experience, depending on the time spent working in SCP-179 prior to its reclassification. SCP-179's existence will be subject to an Orbital Misinformation Standardized Intelligence Obstruction and Neutralization Campaign. As per Omission Protocol 4, most documentation related to SCP-179 has been classified Level 4. Top Secret. Any further data related to SCP-179 has been classified Level 5. Thaumiel. And will be made available only to authorized 5-179 personnel. Be advised that unauthorized access to SCP-179 research materials will be considered a Type 3B offense. Unauthorized data management while lacking appropriate global clearance. Punishable by compulsory memory redaction therapy with immediate reassignment and or demotion. Warning! Unauthorized personnel will be exposed to a memetic defense agent. SCP-179 is sensitive to all radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum, intelligent, and able to communicate through multiple anomalous means, including but not limited to radio and laser communications interference. Only one instance of SCP-179 communication with Foundation personnel has occurred thus far, where SCP-179 proved to be fluent in French. As this contact did not result in a clear statement of SCP-179's intentions towards the Foundation and its mission, all efforts must be made to prevent contact by any known groups of interest with SCP-179. Misinformation operations and other preemptive measures have been deployed. Most recorded movements performed by SCP-179 have been related to extraterrestrial threats, 
Both anomalous are non-anomalous in nature, on a collision or orbital insertion course with the Earth. These threatening items have been identified as capable of causing CK-class reconfiguration events, of diverse impact on human societies and earthly life in general, if allowed to reach Earth. If impact with Earth or orbital insertion occurs without proper response and containment by Foundation operatives, these items of interest may be capable of causing XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios. SCP-179 will usually address an item or items of interest by pointing at them with an arm and, when more than one item of interest is present, will be able to generate additional limbs anatomically identical to its arms, as needed. Survey data indicates that SCP-179 performs other motions specific to each item of interest addressed, such as raising different fingers or moving its arms in an array of as-of-yet undecipherable patterns at fixed intervals. But whether these motions contain any information or not has not been determined to date. The limits of SCP-179's detection capacities have not been clearly ascertained. While SCP-179 has been able to detect potentially harmful objects, Beyond the Trans-Neptunian region, those threats had been detected by other surveillance and exploration systems, usually under Foundation control, or, in at least three separate instances, were visible to the naked eye from Earth. However, they had not been immediately recognized as threats. It has been hypothesized that SCP-179 may only detect and react to active threats that remain detectable to other observing parties, without the Cis-Neptunian region while being able to unerringly determine their harmful nature. All items of interest approaching Earth within cis-Neptunian space that had considerable destructive capacity have been detected by SCP-179 without failure, often when no observers known to the Foundation were aware of them. As such, SCP-179 and all personnel, orbital equipment, and facilities dedicated to its surveillance remain the most reliable early warning system the Foundation possesses to detect and, when possible, prevent potentially dangerous incursions within surveyed space. SCP-179 is able to determine which interplanetary objects pose a threat to Earth, humankind, or the Earthly biosphere, which makes it a critical asset for the Composite Orbital Early Warning System COEWS, project of the Foundation, which currently involves several undisclosed SCPs. Experimental Foundation Orbital Assets Site-34, Site-103, Site-98, Area-8, several other undisclosed sites, and Command Site- as well as several personnel embedded within different space agencies and international consortia related to space exploration. All data of interest related to or obtained through SCP-179 will be marked COEWS-179 which will be considered high-priority information to all Foundation departments. Addendum SCP-179-1 Notable Movements of SCP-179 1312-1940 First recorded movement of SCP-179 The entity, that had remained with both arms crossed, raised an arm towards a previously undetected interplanetary object on a collision course with Earth. After its impact, in an event that damaged the city of Data Expunged extensively with large quantities of an anomalous mucus secretion and left more than 1,300 dead, which, combined with the anomalous phenomena related to, redacted as per previous expungement. Remaining central item reclassified SCP-179 SCP returned to its original position. 2209-1942 Sixth recorded movement of SCP-179 the entity raises an arm towards on a collision course with Earth. Item of interest crashes nearby Auckland, New Zealand on 04-10-1942. Item separates upon impact into several devices of mechanical nature. Data expunged. Recently formed sub-entities with minimal civilian casualties. Once Foundation operatives contain the item proper, SCP-179 returns to its original position. Mobile task forces all data on involved assets expunged from records proceeds to track and destroy all remaining sub-entities. Date undisclosed. 18th recorded movement of SCP-179. The entity raises its right arm towards data expunged. Up to this date, the entity has kept one of its primary arms, 
shifting from one to the other as necessary, pointing in the same direction. 01-03-1949 23rd recorded movement of SCP-179 The entity raises an arm towards an Amor-class asteroid that has adopted a collision course with Earth. The Foundation uses a combination of several SCP objects to launch a remote-controlled interplanetary vehicle that acts as a gravitatory tow line. This mission is announced a success on 03-05-1951. At this time, SCP-179 returns to its original position. Note, surveying elements observed that the entity performed a motion that could have been a nod. Reclassification request to Euclid status filed and denied. 1312, 403rd recorded movement of SCP-179. The entity stops watching the Earth for two days and 13 hours, when it looks towards the Jovian system. Once this interval is over, SCP-179 looks at Earth again. 0909, 2002, 487th recorded movement of SCP-179. SCP-179 points at an armed Type 11 dimensional weapon, launched from Area 8, to test SCP-179's detection capacities. Item remains in a primed configuration for several minutes, ready to be launched at a test location on Earth. It is not identified by SCP-179 until it is 3,670 kilometers above the Earth's surface, when SCP-179 reacts to it as a threat and points at it. Device subsequently reconfigured to a standby configuration and redirected towards its primary target. Data expunged, still in transit from the Kuiper belt. SCP-179 returns to its previous position. 1610, 2003. Contact with SCP-179 is achieved via the 2 probe. Subsequent movements registered in addendum SCP-179-2. SCP-179 reclassified Thaumiel. Addendum SCP-179-2. Events of 1610, 2003. SCP-179 was first approached by the 2 probe, a microsatellite equipped with multiple recording, analysis, and communication devices incorporated into a second probe in a clandestine operation. The probe acted as a relay for the 2 probe and Foundation mission control. Contact and communication with the entity were not foreseen nor programmed. When visual contact with SCP-179 was established, Obtaining an unprecedentedly clear, very high-resolution image of its surface, the entity begins to move its lips, forming the phonemes of a greeting in spoken French. What follows is a complete translation of the exchange. SCP-179 Hello. I'm the Lookout. My name is Sal Susor. Do you like my brother? I like him too. He is big, so big and so very warm. If you want to talk to me, please use your satellite to weave talk to me. It'll be easier than coming here. Probably. Entity remains immobile for approximately 10 minutes. Researchers assigned to SCP-179 detect this movement. Level 3 researcher Thomas Graham, who is fluent in French, is selected by head researcher to conduct a possible exchange with SCP-179. The 2 probe is used as a radio relay from this point onward. SCP-179 is able to receive, understand, and transmit radio communications. SCP-179's transmissions read as a monotone, featureless human voice that speaks in French. The subsequent exchange occurs with a 16 minutes and 39.6 seconds delay between each message, corresponding to the distance between SCP-179 and Earth and return that will be omitted in the rest of this document. Researcher Graham, who are you? SCP-179, my name is Saul Susor. I am the lookout. I behold, I often see, I often warn, almost always when I have to. That way, there is further life. Researcher Graham, what do you mean, the lookout? SCP-179, it's me, Smiles. Researcher Graham, we have noticed the significance of your movements. Who do you report to? SCP-179. To those who know where to look. 
to you, to those who want to look. Not just you, but you too. Researcher Graham, when you say brother, are you referring to the son? SCP-179, he is my brother, Sawel. He warms me up. He is carrying fire and loving light. He caresses me with his arcs and his voice and renews me. He is the source of all true light. He is your source. Researcher Graham, where do you come from? SCP-179, I was born a child. The entity nods towards Earth. Researcher Graham, for how long have you been in your current location? SCP-179, I do not want to tell you. Smiles. SCP-179 adopts a fetal position, remains looking towards the Earth, and pointing at face of the entity remains visible from the two probe. Researcher Graham, how did you reach your current position? How did you acquire the properties you currently possess? SCP-179, I was grown into a woman. This is how I live now. Researcher Graham, could you give us further details, please? SCP-179, no. Researcher Graham, we would like to know more about you. Why not tell us? SCP-179, I am sorry. I won't be yours. I can't belong to any one person. Researcher Graham, the Foundation's work protects all of humanity, all life on Earth. Don't you find this work of the greatest importance? SCP-179, yes, I am doing it. Look upon me and know. Researcher Graham, if we have understood your capacities correctly, we believe you could do far more than that. Sharing all the information you have, not just about the dangerous threats against humankind and Earth, could be of great benefit to all parts involved. SCP-179, I am too big and you are too small. There is a sea of nothing and islands of light. I am their shore. To you come the monsters, the pounding fists of void, the longing gods beyond our knowledge. I am the lookout. I see the ripples in their wake. You want me to pledge my sight no to you, only to you, so you, only you, can be greater. Even if you find, restrain, defend, you want me to be yours. That is not why I am here. There are others. Others I assist. Others I warn. Others beyond your thin walls of gray, dry paste rock. Others beyond the reach of your weary satellites. Others beyond the home, our home. Others I know. Others I love. Others you won't care for. Others that came before. And, over all, others beyond the little walls of rules and bone and laws and flesh and memories and oaths you built around yourselves until you don't even remember them. Others I love, dearly. And yet, only my brother is an equal to me. Researcher Graham, excuse me, I don't understand what you mean by others. Could you please explain yourself with other words? SCP-179, smiles, but I have no words left. Closing, despite several communication attempts, SCP-179 did not perform any other movements, nor transmit other messages. Up to this date, SCP-179 has not responded to any message coming from any Foundation contact team, or any other efforts from known groups of interest. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.